And our next speaker is Stephanie, and she's going to talk to us about privacy preserving routing. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about how do we actually find routes in um, payment networks because a lot of the talks up to now were about how do we keep these routes secure and how can we actually establish these channels. So that's my picture again when I actually had time to get a haircut. <laughs> And let's get started. I mean, you heard this a couple of times today, so I'm going to be really, really quick on that, just to give you some numbers of what blockchains at the moment realize in comparison to other payment networks. Block uh, Bitcoin at the moment, which is not the fastest example, I admit, manages about seven transactions per second, and the Visa network for your credit card manages close to 60,000 transactions per network. Meaning that uh, solutions with cryptocurrencies that we have at the moment do not scale to something that we would like to have in a global payment system. So one idea to solve this are these payment channels. And today I'm going to focus on bidirectional channels for the examples. What I'm telling you will also work for uniform, uh, for unidirectional channels, actually it will be a bit easier for those, but we use those because the data set that we had used bidirectional channels. So if we have a channel that has a total capacity of x plus y in our case and is represented by a balance between the nodes a and b, and we'll, if we give you this picture it means that a can send up to x units of credit to b and B can send up to Y units of credit to A. Now what happens if A can actually send um, this amount of um, currency? Well, the balance of the payment channel will change, so A can now only send X minus Z to B, but B on the other hand could send X uh, Y plus Z to A. So this is what happens when the network changes. And this might not be a surprise, but there's a couple of networks for which this might be applicable. Um, oh no, let's first talk about intermediate um, nodes. You can concatenate these payment channels. So for example, if the sender S wants to send a credit value of five to the receiver for R, but they do not have a direct channel, they could use an intermediate node or multiple intermediate nodes. And what would happen here is the sender would first send the five Bitcoin, for example, to the intermediate node, and then the intermediate node would forward it to the receiver. And all of these links change, but the total balance of the node in the middle does not change. The amount of incoming credit is still the same as before, and the amount of outgoing credit as well. So now let's talk about what kind of networks are interested in this um, multi-hop payments. Well, one of which we heard a lot today is obviously the Lightning Network. And let's talk a bit about how these different solutions manage their security and the reliability. In the Lightning case, we, everything is backed by the Bitcoin blockchain. If, on the other hand, we're talking about something like Interledger, which tries to manage cross-chain, um, payments, then we have a slightly different problem. We're having payment channels where some people might be in the Bitcoin blockchain and some others might be in this red blockchain and they still want to exchange money. And then you have to back the, trans the security of the transaction by somehow combining multiple blockchains. And a third example comes from the world of credit or I own you networks where some of the approaches do not actually need a blockchain at all. So there the idea is that you sign your payment channels using signature schemes and then have um, accountability schemes. But what all of those is in have in common is you want to get from one sender to a receiver and you want to know how do we get there. And this is where my work comes in, which is routing. And what Lightning is using at the moment is source or sender routing which means that the sender decides on the path, but it then needs to know the complete network, or at least the last fraction, large fraction of the network to be able to decide how to route the payment. So that's not the case for our protocol. We made the assumption that the nodes have only a local view. So you know 
your payment channels and your neighbors, but you do not know anything about a global network. Let's a bit talk about why do we think that's a good assumption. One reason is privacy. If, especially if we're looking into the credit network case where such a link can mean, I owe you $10,000. That's probably something I do not want to, to spread, uh, I do not want to make public to everyone. So, but even if you're not interested in privacy, you might be interested in this for scalability reasons. Because if everyone to the sites on routes needs the view of the network, the way the network is at this point in time, that means you have to, spread, uh, to, um, to get all the updates to everyone really fast. And then we're essentially back in the blockchain uh, scenario. We have to spread state information to everyone in the network in a very short time of, uh, period of time. If, on the other hand, we say we only rely on this local view, we do not have to worry about spreading updates to anyone because you're only interested into what are our local channels right here next to me. So that's a strong advantage with regard to scalability and also privacy. A second aspect here is that in this work we make essentially no assumption about what the payment network looks like apart from one, it needs to be connected. Because if you have two components and there is no payment channel between them, there's no way you can get one payment from one component to another one. So that's the only standard assumption, but apart from this, this wouldn't work with any network structure that you have. Which also might mean that if you know a lot about your network and you know that it's only a couple of super nodes that are all connected and everyone else connects to this node, so the algorithm that I will show you will still work, but it might be a bit of an overkill because it's very gen generic. So you might want to adapt it in the end to what your specific requirements are. So I mentioned the topic of privacy a bit. So since there were a couple of talks that talked about their interpretation of privacy, let's talk a bit about the one that we're using in this paper. In a nutshell, intuitively, what we want to hide is how much does the sender send to the receiver? So the value of the payment should be hidden and who the is the sender and who is the recipient. What are we assuming with regard to the adversary? We're focusing on something that is common in anonymity networks such as Tor. So we have a local adversary that is both passive and active. So we might have an adversary that can see some of the links or that can actually insert its own participants into the network and try to break the privacy of the routing. And now a slightly more formalized version of our privacy models without going into the actual security games would be we want value privacy, which essentially means if one node makes a payment to another node, an adversary that is not involved in the payment should not be aware what is actually happening, how much money are we sending. And the second property that we want is sender and receiver privacy. This is very close to anonymity. I will say something about why we're not calling it anonymity in a moment. And here the idea is if you have a node in the network, either one that is passively observing links or one that is actually an intermediate node in the network, then this node should not with absolute certainty know who is the sender and who is the recipient. So what the node will know, or if it's forwarding the payment, it will know something like this is coming from the node E, so it's somehow in this direction, and this is going in this direction, so the recipient will be there. But it will not with absolute certainty know who is the sender and who is the recipient. And the reason why we're not calling it anonymity is because that's weaker than what something like the Tor network would give you which optimally at least wants to say everyone could be the sender and the recipient. And that's something we cannot provide in this case because we know something about the direction from which we are getting the payment. So we can make some guesses and exclude certain nodes as being sender or recipient. 
Okay, so that is uh, our goals with regard to privacy, and obviously our goals with regard to performance is that we want to actually find those routes, so we want to be effective, and we want to be fast, so use very, uh, have, find them in a fast and reliable manner. So this is our protocol, and I'm going to uh, describe it to you in three steps. I'm first going to tell you how we actually do the setup of the network, how, with, what type of state information we keep. In the second step, I'm going to describe the actual routing algorithm, and afterwards I'm going to tell you how do we deal with dynamics, how do we deal with new uh, uh, payment channels that are opened and with old payment channels that are closing. So let's first look into the setup of Speedy Murmurs. This is a small example of a payment network, and the black links are going to indicate payment channels. And to have a better overview, I'm just not giving you any values for the state channels at the moment, because um, we can do this without having those, and it's easier to follow. So what we're doing in Speedy Murmurs is we built a spanning tree in a distributed manner. So there's a couple of spanning tree algorithms that work on distributed systems. Just select your favorite algorithm. And then we're assigning coordinates that represent the node position in the spanning tree. In our case, we decided upon a vector-based coordinate system. So what we did, the root node on top of the spanning tree gets the empty coordinate as, uh, the empty vector as a coordinate, and then every internal node enumerates its children, and the child coordinate is the parent coordinate in addition to an enumeration index. If that sounds complicated, it's actually quite easy in practice. So the children of the root node would simply get the coordinates one and two, because the parent coordinate is the empty vector, and then you add an enumeration index. And for the, no, for the children of the node with the coordinate 1, we now again append um, coordinate, uh, append indexes, so it's 1, 1, and 1, 2. And the last node in the tree gets the coordinate 1, 2, 1. So this is pretty simple, and the nice thing about it is that now we can define a distance function in these coordinates, which is at the lengths of the two to coordinates minus twice the common prefix lengths. The common prefix uh, length is how many elements do these two coordinates have in common. Leading elements have the two coordinates in common. And this is exactly the same as saying this is the number of green edges we have to walk along to get from one node to another. So this is great, so now we have the setup, but what we actually want to do is we want to find paths. And optimally, we might want to have more than one payment pass, because you might have a large payment and you want to split it over several paths because one of them does not have enough credit, but if you use multiple of them, you can actually fulfill the payment. So we're not doing that once, we're taking T different trees, so that people can use different paths and use the sum of all the payment as the total payment. It also helps with hiding the transaction value if you split it over several payments. <laughs> so how do we actually now do the routing? Well, it's a two-step protocol essentially. In the beginning, our sender node has to decide how many paths do I use, for example, all T of them, and then she has to split the total transaction value into um, T shares that add up to the, to the total value. So in our simulations, we will just do that randomly, but if you have any like information that could help to do it in a different way, if you know something about the network that might help you make a different decision, any scheme for splitting them up would do. And now that's the actual routing protocol, we're going hop by hop, so every node along the route or along the T routes will make a decision based on, on the one hand, the coordinates and on its local payment channels. So here we're having, again, a small subset of the network where it did not um, give you all the links, but only the links that are relevant for this decision. So in this case, we have the node with the coordinate 2. The node knows that the receiver coordinate is 1, 1 and it wants to route the payment towards 1-1. So what it will do, it will look at all of its neighbors 
and it will look at two factors. The first one is the coordinates. It will consider all neighbors that are closer to the recipient in terms of coordinate, which um, you can calculate it yourself with the distance function from the last slide. But in this case, that would be all of the three. And the second criteria is, does the link have enough balance to actually satisfy the payment? Because we want to route a payment of C1, we're in the first three or five. And um, if you're trying to route that via a link that only has a balance of three, this does not work because we don't have the uh, respective credit. So two has to send the payment to the root node because that's the only link that has sufficient credit. And the root node will then do the same and select the next node from its neighbors. So this is how the routing works. However, we're in a highly dynamic network. There are new payment channels that are coming up, and then there are old payment channels that are closed. So we need to deal with this in some way. We need to deal with dynamics, and we do not want to rebuild it, uh, the spanning tree every time something changes, right? So what we're doing is we're only locally rebuilding it. Only those nodes that are affected by the change will change their coordinates. So in this example, let's say that this payment channel disappears. Now we're having a problem because the node with the coordinate 1, 2, 1 is no longer part of the spanning tree. What it will do, it will look at its other neighbor and then simply establish a spanning tree link to those neighbor and this neighbor and change its coordinate to 1, 1, 1. So in this case, that's simple. If this node had further descendants, they would also have to change their coordinates. But assuming that we're in a tree structure with logarithmic death, the number of nodes that have to change for any failed links is very low, usually logarithmically, in expectation. Of course, there are some cases where you have to do more work if it's a link very close to the root, but the average cost of adapting to changes is very low in comparison to recomputing everything. Now we should probably go a bit on to how does this network actually perform in practice. I'm first going to talk about privacy and then I'm going to talk about the actual performance values. With regard to privacy, well, val value privacy is not really a surprise. We're not spreading the value that we're sending to anyone who is not on the path, so it's hidden from nodes on the path. At least that's the informal argument. What is interesting is we did not actually put it into the security definition because it's hard to make any real statement on this, statements on this, is what about nodes on the path? Because they don't see the complete payment. They only see what is sent along their path. So they can estimate the, the complete payment. If you have the example that an adversarial node is forwarding a payment of value five, and it knows there are two trees, so the payment is split over two paths, it can say an expectation this probably was a um, payment of value 10, and it can even give you a probability distribution of what the actual value is. So, here you lose a bit in terms of privacy because there's some leaked information. If you have a node on the path, if you have a node that is not on the path, it does not get any information about the value. As for sender and receiver privacy, we have to admit we were lazy here. These coordinates have been used for routing in peer-to-peer -peer networks before, and there they had the same problem of trying to hide the recipient. So. In the, way that I, in the way that I presented the scheme, you needed this receiver address, which would identify the recipient. There is a way to hide it and still do the routing, but it's a bit complicated, and since it's work that was done in another paper, I'm not going to present it here. But you are welcome to ask me or look it up. Now let's go to the interesting aspect of performance. We're going to look into two three performance metrics. First, how successful are we in finding these routes, if they exist? Then, how fast are we abstractly measured in the number of messages that we need to send? And in the last step, how well do we react to dynamics? So, we use the real-world data set, which I know is not perfect for this case, 
but um, it's the best we could do at the time when we did the study. So we used the Ripple data set, which is a credit network, and that's roughly 60,000 nodes, which have, uh, which executed about 300,000 transactions between 2013 and 2016. And we used this network and compared silent whispers, which was one of the uh, state-of-the-art routing algorithms for these before we did the study, our protocol speedy murmurs, and just for comparison, we looked at the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. So you might have realized in some way routing here is a flow problem. You have something going from a sender, which is the sink, to a, uh, a, a, the source, to a receiver who is the sink. So how does that compare? Well, of those payments that could actually be satisfied, um, silent whispers, which was the state-of-the-art algorithm before ours, only managed to, uh, to find routes for about 65% of those. Our algorithm discovered roughly 90%, and that was in the first try. The advantage is, if you fail, maybe you remember that initially you split the, ra the value randomly. So you could simply try a different split and see if that works. So 90% in the first try. And of course, Ford Fulkerson could satisfy all of them because it does an exhaustive search of the network. So of course, looking at this slide, what you would say is, well, use the Ford Fulkerson algorithm. You can even do that without state information. However, let's have a look at the messages. So this is again um, Silent Whispers, Speedy Murmurs, and Ford Fulkerson. And you might not see the end of this graph, but <laughs> to have a look here, Ford Fulkerson requires about 50,000 messages in a 60,000 node network to satisfy one transaction. <laughs> And differ, in comparison, we need about 15 messages, and um, Silent Whispers is at roughly four times of this, um, 85, 84. So essentially, we uh, have a good compromise between a success ratio and um, performance in terms of the number of messages. Let's quickly talk about um, dynamics. For the dynamics, I first have to give you some information on our data set. So what you see here is the epochs, essentially this is one day over a period of three years, and what each of these points gives you is on the one hand, the transactions. How many transactions did happen in the Ripple network on this specific day? And more interesting for the dynamics, how many set links operations were executed? What is a set link operation? Well, in terms of payment channels, that would either be opening a new channel or closing it. Ripple also gives you the possibility to change the capacity of a channel. So that's not really something that exists in every network, but in Ripple, you can do that. In Lightning, that would be something like closing a channel and opening a new one between the same nodes. And you can see that those usually happen in, um, that those usually are crowded again, uh, in uh, that there are uh, clusters of them happening. And that's interesting for our actual performance here looking into silent whispers, which is the old protocol, and speed in the murmurs, which is the next new one. You can see that uh, for silent whispers, the overhead of stabilizing the network is constant in the number of edges, which is because they simply rebuild the complete information once a day. So regardless of how much happened on this day, at some point everything will be rebuilt. While we, on the other hand, have this dynamic stabilization. You can see in most cases we're like orders of magnitude lower. We only need like a hundred messages in comparison to something that is about 10,000 to a million. However, there are two, um, two cases where we are worse than speedy murmurs. And if you're looking down here, those correspond to this large number of edges that are added to the network at the same time. Essentially, this just means that if you have a very dynamic situation where an unusual amount of stuff changes in the network, stabilizing right away does not pay off because you have to change it again and again. 
And there should probably be a trigger to recognize such a situation and then just say we're waiting and rebuilding everything when this like mass join has ended. So these are the lessons learned from looking at speedy murmurs. Summarizing this, I introduced an embedding-based routing protocol. Embedding-based routing means a routing based on these coordinates that we assigned. I talked a bit about how can you do dynamic maintenance in this type of a network. What I did not talk about, but what is in the paper, we can also deal with concurrency. So if you have two transactions at the same time, we can make sure that there is no trouble, that they do not interact with each other negatively. Using a very conservative approach that makes sure that your payment cannot actually fail. If, it, if we previously said it will be successful. We showed that it's effective, so we have a high success ratio. Efficient, because we need a low number of messages. It's scalable, I didn't really talk about it, but it's logarithmic in the number of nodes, both for dealing with dynamics and for dealing with um, routing. And it has privacy-preserving properties. It has a large range of applicability, starting at something like lightning, silent whispers, credit networks, or intellectual. And if you got interested into routing and want to try your own algorithms, if you're saying, I can tweak that, or I want to tweak that in such a way that it is great for the network that I'm building, we have the clean data set from Ripple Online as well as our simulation code where you can simply plug your own routing algorithm in and see how it does. And I quickly close with some um, selfish advertisement. I've just been offered a assistant professorship at TU Delft, working with the blockchain lab. And I just got the first money for students, so I'm really looking into PhD students who want to look maybe in realizing off-chain transactions, routing. I'm also interested in anonymity in cryptocurrencies and in general. And not closely related to this event, but I'm also interested in censorship resistance, such as decoy routing and Freenet. Um, and you would live in a really nice Dutch city close to the ocean with the beach. So if you're interested, talk to me or send me an email, which is a bit weird because I don't have a Delft email address yet. So you have to send it to Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have to come to Canada, which is a nice place as well. So questions. <laughs> Awesome, uh, awesome, fantastic talk. So we're taking questions. I see a hop, hand up immediately. Uh, great talk. Um, how do you deal with Byzantine behavior within the uh, spanning tree building process? That's actually a really good question. Um, it depends on the type of um, Byzantine behavior. Yeah. There are some algorithms that can deal with it to a certain extent. What we would actually need, what we haven't tried and how effective it is, would be, um, there are two options to do it. There are spanning tree algorithms that can deal with it as long as there is a certain number of nodes. But I think for this approach, it might be more interesting to have an approach that deals with the fact that there are and that says there are a limited number of malicious edges, because that's where you actually have to invest something in building edges. And there are some recent approaches that can deal with the saying there are only this and this many malicious edges. They have one problem, they're almost everywhere, which means that with the highest certainty, most of the tree will converge to the correct solution, but there might be a small part that does not. So we haven't really tried it on this type of networks, also because we wanted to have more reliable network models than Ripple. But it's a good point. That's one of the things that need to be fixed. And that is actually one of the things that we're looking into at the moment, how applicable are these rather new Byzantine algorithms for this type of um, networks. But great questions. 
I, uh, the great talk. So I like to ask you like a quick question, like um, uh, two quick questions. One is like uh, uh, every node had to build its like own map. It cannot inherit the uh, map from the others nodes. Second is like uh, uh, there's no way to uh, guarantee the uh, atomicity of the transfer because you have to divide the uh, transfer into the multiple um, small transfers. Um, so the first question was, I guess, can you inherit the, the, the coordinates or maps of the other nodes? Um, no, you can not as such. I guess that would be problematic because you would have to have exactly the same links so to, to adhere to the spanning tree structure. And can you say, what was the second question again? The second question, like uh, you'd have to divide with the multiple path and like multiple amounts, right? So can you, uh, uh, like could fail on some path, right? You cannot guarantee the uh, atomicity, like uh, either you fail or you success. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the algorithm is actually done, I went over this, I did not really say that, but it's do, done in a two-phase um, way. So you first do the routing and proactively block the payment, but you don't consider it paid and only if you have the guarantee that it will go through. You do the actual update. So it's a two-step update that makes sure that even if it fails, there, is, um, there will not be any money lost. So you can have a look in the paper. There are guarantees that you do not lose money, but it might be that you end up with the money that you had before because the payment fails. Awesome. I can also add for Lightning, there's multi-path payments where the idea is that when you send it down several routes, you only learn the secret once you get all the roots. So you, get, you can get to make it atomic and lightning as well. And there's a question down here. I got a microphone. Um, awesome. Routing fees, did you consider routing fees um, within the routing algorithm? Because that's the beauty of source routing, for example, that I can uh, select a route which has like um, good fees from my point of view, whereas with your algorithm, yeah, how would that work? Exactly. That's um, the nice thing about the algorithm is that you could have it as an additional um, constraint during the routing, which would likely um, decrease the success ratio because you would also take that into consideration. Um, I didn't go into details, but a lot of the times, if you do the routing, you at some points have several possibilities. So in the example, you know you could only send it to the root node, but sometimes there are several nodes that satisfy this criterion. So in this case, you could, for example, use fees. You could have something that considers fees from the really beginning, but then um, it would be complicated. But I agree, there is, um, especially if we're dealing with a case where the fees um, vary a lot between different routes, we should take those into consideration and maybe do multiple attempts starting with finding one with like strong constraints on the fees, and if we realize that that doesn't happen, we could execute a routing algorithm again, because it's relatively cheap in comparison to existing routing algorithms. But yeah, we consider it, it one of the problems why we did not implement it was that it is really, really hard to have a good model on what fees look like at the moment. I think it's a bit better now, but at the time when we started this, was which, which was in mid-2016, um, that, that, uh, most of this research was pretty new and pretty in flow. And getting uh, reliable data sets, especially at the time, but still now, that help us to actually understand how to fine tune the routing algorithms is still kind of tricky because Lightning is still in its startup phase and we don't really know what will it be when it stabilizes. Awesome. Thank you very much. One more round of applause. That's awesome. <laughs> awesome.